Right, so it's telling me we're recording. So today we're going to start a new sermon series. It's going to be a 10 week series looking at the 12 disciples and what their lives and and what their own experiences can tell us about Jesus's power to transform lives. And this particular that sermon today is called Andrew, Bringing Others to Jesus. Now, if we think about them as a group, let's be honest, they weren't a particularly special bunch. They weren't necessarily clever men. They didn't come with deg degrees from famous universities. Most of them worked in some form of manual labour with one, at least one of them being a low-level government official. Jesus chose them after spending a night on a mountainside praying. He chose a group of fearful and faithless men who in three years he would mould into a worldwide movement. And over this time they would accompany Jesus on his ministry, travelling with him, learning from him, and being sent out by him to preach and cast out evil spirits. Now we could indeed ask, why did he choose them? Especially when he knew that one would betray him. Well, he chose them because he knew that in the time they spent with him, their lives would be transformed. They would all be changed by the power of Jesus. Eleven would become outspoken and fearless witnesses for the gospel. And even the one who would ultimately betray him would be changed. The spirit would become hardened to Jesus and his love. And so as just as they were transformed, I hope that just by looking at them in a bit more detail, we too will also be transformed. As we encounter them in the Bible, we will see how they were changed through their association with Jesus. And at the same time, we'll be reminded that Jesus is still in the business of changing lives. And that includes ours as well. He can take the most fearful and faithless among us and empower us to be confident witnesses to his grace and forgiveness. And if there was ever a time when we needed to be those type of witnesses, it is certainly now. And so today we're going to begin exactly where Jesus himself began, and that's with Andrew. In looking at Andrew's experience, I wanted to see what it means to interest others in Jesus. To see the importance of sharing our faith to others and how we might go about it. I also want us to see how we should respond if Jesus calls us into a deeper relationship with him. And one character trait that Jesus looks for in those he calls. Now, I never had any brothers or sisters, but if I had, then I'm pretty sure I would have probably liked having Andrew as a brother. If I'd known Jesus's closest followers personally, I might have gone to Nathaniel for a Bible study, maybe to Matthew for investment advice. But for a friend, a brother who would love me no matter what, I would have chosen Andrew. He wasn't one of the major players among the disciples. In fact, you could argue he always seems to be playing a supporting role. And yet he did one of the most important things that anyone could do. And that was bringing someone else to Jesus. And he did it more than once. And let's be frank, as followers of Jesus, there is ultimately nothing more important we can do for someone than that. When we think about Andrew, he comes across as someone who was on a, was on a search. He seems to have had a deep spiritual hunger 
He wanted the Lord to have the primary place in his heart and mind. Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist and absorbed this somewhat eccentric preacher's message of repentance and preparation. One day Jesus had seen Jesus approaching and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then the next day, seeing Jesus again, he says to the two disciples who were with him, look, the Lamb of God. These two immediately left the Baptist and began to follow Jesus. We know that one of them was Andrew, and although the other is unnamed, it's probably John, the son of Zebedee, and the author of this gospel although he never claims it was him. Now it could be argued that they were abandoning John to follow Jesus, but it's important to remember what John the Baptist's role was in the story. He was the forerunner of the Messiah, the coming one. God had told him that he would recognise the Messiah by a sign. That when John baptised him, the spirit would descend and remain on him. And he did indeed see that. And so John, once he recognised that Jesus was the promised one, he began to point others to Jesus. And so Andrew and the other disciple, they weren't abandoning John to follow Jesus, but were acting on the fulfilment of what John had been teaching. John understood this completely, and he encouraged their decision, although not all of his followers did leave him. And if we read in Mark's Gospel, we would see some, some stayed with him, even up until his death. And so as the story unfolds that Julie read to us, we can learn valuable lessons that should help us as we share the good news with others. We see from the passage that when Jesus sees them following, he asks, what do you want? Now on the face of it, it's a very simple question, which they answered. But John, the author of this gospel, he often writes on two levels. In one sense, Jesus' question is just straight narrative. And John is simply telling the story of what happened. But Jesus also wanted these men and I believe us as well, to reflect on a deeper level. It's almost as if Jesus confronts those who show any interest in following him and wants them to say out loud, to express what they really want in life. I wonder how we would answer Jesus's question if he was to ask us that now. It's a question that could really help us in sharing the gospel. When so many today recognise there is a void in their life, which we're trying to fill, but they don't know what they're looking for. I wonder how may they, they might respond if we simply said to them, what do you want? And Andrew and the other disciple, they answer Jesus by calling him rabbi. It's a title of honour and respect, a word that means teacher. And would it have implied that they wanted to be taught by and learn from Jesus? They ask him where he's staying, and he invites them to come along and see, which they do. They then spend the rest of the day with Jesus. And although we don't know at all what was discussed, it's clear that this time had a massive impact on their lives. On one level, Jesus was simply being friendly, which, let's face it, is a great first step in evangelism and disciple making. But on another level, Jesus was already drawing them into a deeper relationship with him, and with it, a deeper commitment. Now, if we're in the church as normal, it would be easier for me to answer this question and to, to hear what he had to say. But when we think back to our own stories, I wonder what prompted us to follow Jesus. Were you brought up in a Christian family? Did a Christian friend encourage you? 
Did you simply encounter Jesus in the Bible? For me, non-Christian friends had invited me to come to a Christian youth club that they all went to. I went along and I'll be honest, I had a great time, but I had no interest at all in hearing about Jesus. But whether I wanted to or not, I was exposed to the gospel. One night, having gone away on a youth camp, he broke into my life and in a sense asked me, what do you want? And I realised it wasn't the things I thought I wanted. And so in my own way, I told him I wanted to follow him. And once I had met with Jesus, I felt an overwhelming compulsion to tell others about what had happened. And in our passage, we see the same was true of Andrew. Whatever happened in those hours with Jesus, the first thing he did afterwards was to go and find his brother, Simon, who to us is more commonly known as Peter. Andrew was convinced that Jesus was the promised Messiah. Look again at what he says to his brother. We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. Having made this stunning announcement, he then brings Peter to Jesus. Now on the face of it, there's nothing to suggest that Peter had any hesitation in responding to his brother's claim that he had found the Messiah. But let's be real here. It's highly unlikely that he didn't have questions. The Messiah, how do you know? Who is he? Andrew's actions and enthusiasm demonstrate that often the most common and effective testimony to others is a private witness of a friend to a friend. People who know us best. But having said that, it's not always easy sharing the gospel with those we're closest to. It can sometimes be very difficult to talk to family members or close friends about a commitment to Jesus? What do we do if they reject Jesus' offer of forgiveness, reject his offer of salvation? They're people who know us best, and they will have seen our struggles and failures. It's easy to feel like we're becoming pushy, or let's dread the dreaded word, preachy. If those closest to us reject Jesus, all we can do is continue to pray for them and do our best to live our lives in a way that show to them the place that Christ has in our lives. This can sometimes be just as powerful as anything we say. And it's something that Peter himself would encourage in his first letter. Now I remember speaking to a chap who came to faith on an alpha course he was telling me about the conversations he was having with his wife about his new faith she at the time was not a believer but she told him that she liked the change that jesus had made in his life whether we share the gospel by word or through action the most important thing is we simply do it. But let's go back to Andrew. I mentioned earlier how we would also see how we should respond if Jesus calls us into a deeper relationship, what he might be looking for in our character. So let's look at what we can learn from him in that respect. If we were reading in Matthew's Gospel, we would see that when Jesus called Andrew away from his fishing career and into a full-time discipleship, he simply dropped what he was doing and followed him. I think we can see from the minute he first met Jesus, he was someone who was fully committed to following him. His friendship with Jesus began at the point he first began to follow him. To that place where he was staying 
and it would only deepen over the months ahead. Andrew started down the path of discipleship and he never looked back. At each level of new commitment, he was ready to say yes to Jesus. And I'm sure that many of us here today could share a time when Jesus has called us into a new level of commitment to him. We often use a term, don't we? We're on a journey. Sometimes on that journey, Jesus will basically ask us to step it up a gear. There's been a number of times when that's happened in my life, and it's probably no surprise to any of you that none more so when I heard him, heard him calling me to leave behind the world of policing and to train for Baptist ministry. I would be lying if I said my initial response was, thank you, Lord, I thought you would never ask. In fact, it was quite the opposite. I resisted and I argued for a good year or so. And all the time there was this battle going on inside me. But when I did finally submit, I at last knew peace and simply asked him to show me the way. And as a result, my relationship with him has grown deeper and continues to do so. And then we look at Andrew's character. And if we look quite closely, we'll see one trait I would suggest is probably the most important of all, and that's humility. Leaving behind the gospel accounts of Andrew's call to be a disciple, we would find that in a, every later reference to him in the New Testament, he is called Simon Peter's brother. Somehow his name seems to be forgotten. Everyone knew Peter, but not as many knew Andrew. And that, I think, tells us a lot about his character and his attitude, both as a man and a Christian. He was someone who was happy to live in his brother's shadow, if it meant fulfilling God's purpose for him. It made no difference to him that his brother would have such a prominent place in the early church. And as God's instrument, would reach many others with the gospel. That didn't matter. Both would share in Christ's reward for their faithfulness. Jesus in Matthew 11 describes himself as gentle and humble in heart. And in Mark 10, we did not come to be served, but to serve. The apostle Paul in Philippians 2 tells us that, that in humility, we should value others above ourselves. And then in Colossians 3, he encourages us to clothe, our, clothe ourselves with humility. These are just a few of the many references in the Bible that show the importance of humility. And so there can be very little doubt that it's something that should be evident in our characters. A few final thoughts about Andrew. Church tradition says that Andrew died at Petrae in Greece around AD 60. The local governor was so enraged that his wife and brother had become Christians that he condemned Andrew to be crucified. Andrew is said to have asked to be executed on an X-shaped cross, feeling unworthy to die on the same shaped cross as Jesus. The X-shaped cross has been known ever since as St Andrew's cross. Andrew is supposed to have lingered on the cross for almost three days. And during hours of consciousness, he urged those looking on to believe in Jesus. Now these accounts may or may not be accurate, but they were consistent with the Andrew we have met in the Bible. So to recap, what have we learned from Andrew today? We've learned the importance of sharing our faith with others whenever we have the opportunity. We've learned to say yes to Jesus if he's calling us to go deeper in our relationship with him. 
when we have learned the importance of humility in the character of those who Jesus calls to follow him. There are all things that we may struggle with at times. But I think when we look at Andrew's life, we should strive to follow how he lived his life, how he responded to Jesus and the characteristics that he displayed in his life.